will forget at the end. Thank everybody for listening to these lectures and for your very kind hospitality. It's been a wonderful time. Uh, the food always looked good. I didn't, wasn't able to eat as much of it as I wanted. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is joint work with Amit Ghosh and Andrei Reznikov, and it's about the nodal lines of mass cusp form. So it's about the objects that we've been talking about, but a question that is extremely difficult. So I will, this lecture will be, I will actually give a proof here. So this will be a more standard kind of lecture on some work that's just been completed. So let me remind you, since we've been going through all these lectures, some of this is already introduced, but I'll just review it. So these automorphic cusp forms, as I've been explaining, are the building blocks of, of modern automorphic form theory. And the, ma the, the forms I want to talk about today are the everywhere unramified cusp forms for two by two matrices over the rationals. Everywhere unramified. So if you win GL1, if you're in one dimension less, we would be talking about the Riemann zeta function, the most basic of all automorphic forms, or the L function of the most basic automorphic form. In GL2, these everywhere unramified forms are called mass forms, and even their existence is quite mysterious. So I want to remind you what they are. So we have the Apoff plane, we have SL2Z. This group, this lecture will be just about the most forms just on this group. So we have the Apoff plane H, we have gammas SL2Z. As you know, this gives us a complex curve or a Riemann surface with a hyperbolic metric. It's the second viewpoint that we'll be taking in this lecture. This is the usual fundamental domain that you see in any uh, complex analysis book. And I'm drawing that fundamental domain because I'm going to show you some decorated pictures on it in a moment. So this is the setting. And uh, much of what I say here so far we understand is understood in our work only for this group or groups like it where there's a certain symmetry. So we're going to be exploiting a symmetry of the modular group very heavily in order to understand the nodal lines. So let me remind you that they, if we go back here, there is a symmetry of this. Some people like to think of it here. There's a reflection symmetry about, say, this y-axis. There's a symmetry uh, which is an isometry of the hyperbolic metric. It's, it's anti-conformal. But if I'm doing hyperbolic geometry, that's a good isometry, and we should be taking that into account. So th there's th one such transformation. You think you might reflect in one any of those three sides. There's no God-given fundamental domain. That's not a canonically defined set. But what I'm about to give you now, this set here that I'm giving you, is a canonically defined piecewise geodesic inside the modular group, inside the modular s hyperbolic surface, which I'm going to call delta. And it's the fixed point set of the transformation, which I just mentioned. Z goes to minus Z bar. That's a global isometry of the hyperbolic plane. It descends to an isometry of the quotient. That's clear. And that's the unique extra automorphism of this hyperbolic surface. So this is a very important transformation. I'm going to call it sigma. It's going to play a big role in this lecture. It's fixed points. So the fixed points of sigma, the set of Z in the X is always the modular surface. So the set of points consists of the y-axis up to the point i, the semicircle with modulus 1 from i to rho, and then from rho back to infinity. So it's this piecewise geodesic con consisting of three arcs. And it's closed. It's closed in the, in the quotient. So that, the symmetry singles out this fixed curve, and I will be returning to this quite often. Now let me remind you what these everywhere unramified automorphic forms are. They were introduced by Mars first although he could never prove their existence. He was very interested in whether they exist. They defined as follows. They are functions on the up half plane, which are periodic, get five gamma z's, five z's, so they live on the quotient. I'm going to also assume they're even, phi of sigma of z, so relative to this symmetry of this hyperbolic surface, I'll assume that the sign is plus one. These are even guys. So this is what is going to make them everywhere unramified in the representation theoretic language. I want them to be square integrable, so they automatically, once the eigenvalue is positive in this setting, we know there are no residues of Eisenstein series, so the continuous spectrum I'll ignore in this lecture. I'm going to look at these cusp forms. 
So this square integrability already implies that you are a cusp form, which uh, I have mentioned in the uh, some other lectures, but here I'll just treat it as a square integrability condition. And of course, delta is the hyperbolic Laplacian. So we're looking for solutions to this equation for no numbers lambda. Uh, these are the bound states. These are these basic everyone ramified forms. As I say, Mars, who was invented the theory of Mars forms, asked the question if there are any. It's not obvious there are any. I'll, the existence of these was proved by Selberg. In fact, the development of the famous Selberg trace formula was done precisely to answer this question. He was uh, asked by Siegel and Mars if these things exist, or they were asking this, and he listened quietly. And then he had the idea, well, maybe I, if I compute the trace, I'll see from that whether they exist or not. No explicit such things have ever been constructed. We only know they exist in abundance, as you'll see. I will write every eigenvalue as a quarter plus t phi squared. Well, we've seen this Selberg conjecture. We know that the eigenvalue is always supposed <laughs> to be bigger than a quarter, so t phi will be a real number. They are in this. It's easy to prove that if they exist, la uh, lambda here. The first eigenvalue is about 90, as it turns out. We're not varying the Riemann surface. The eigenfunctions, I'll assume, are eigenfunctions of these Heck operators, which I already defined in a previous lecture, but I'll remind you what they are. So this is this averaging coming from correspondences, T and C, which maps these functions back into themselves. The, this Tn commutes with the Laplacian. So we, have, we can, if we like, simultaneously diagonalize. Or if the spectrum of the modular group, if these lambdas were simple, then we would be very sim in a very similar situation to uh, Model and Ramanujan. The way Model proved Ramanujan's statement about the multiplicativity was he exploited the fact that the cusp forms of weight 12 is a one-dimensional space. So it is believed, and numerics indicate, that all these eigenvalues are simple. So this Hecker eigenvalue assumption is probably redundant. But, of course, we don't know how to show the eigenvalues are simple, so I'll just assume we have an eigenform when I discuss this. So, as I said, Selberg was the first to prove the existence of these cusp forms. And not only did he prove their existence, he showed there are many, enough so that Weyl's law was true for the cusp forms alone, meaning there are enough, enough cusp forms to make the Weyl law true, which would be the situation if it were a compact quotient. So most of the spectrum is cuspidal. That's why he was able to show that it's there without demonstrating one such thing. They're very important, these uh, mass cusp forms. They're the most elusive of all objects. <coughs> so from the trace formula that Selberg introduced, and he was able to prove that the, uh, if you order the eigenvalues, so n phi will be the ordering, they're discrete numbers, n is the nth number, so each, eigen, each mode has a numbering, and I'll call that numbering n. If n phi is the, the numbering, then the eigenvalues asymptotic to 24 times the numbering. So they are infinitely many, n goes to infinity, and they go roughly, the eigenvalues are 24 times that. The 24 is connected to the area of the fundamental domain. Okay, so this lecture is about something that has been around from the very beginning, but about which Nothing was ever, one was not able to say anything. And that is, let's look at the zero set of an eigenfunction. Now, firstly, the, the, we, we, are, we can assume our eigenfunction is real valued because we have uh, Laplacian. It's a sim real symmetric operator, not, a, not the, a complex emission operator. So I'm going to use this. So complex holomorphic functions, you, you look at the zero set, you look at complex zeros in one dimension, these are points. I mentioned this great theorem of sound and Holowinski about the distribution of the zeros. But here, these things are much more transcendental objects. They are genuine eigenfunctions of an elliptic operator. Nobody expects to write any of these numbers down. I'm sure they're all transcendental. But they are central to everything. And if we want to study them, as I'm saying they're real, let's look at the zero set. So z phi is going to be the place where the eigenfunction vanishes, which is now a piecewise analytic subset of the surface x. Of course, it's a analytic because we're looking at solutions to an elliptic equation. The complement, the surface minus the zero set, I'm going to give you a picture in a second, decomposes into a certain number of components. And those components are called nodal components or nodal domains, and the zero set are called nodal lines. 
and they are well studied in the theory of partial differential equations. Here's a picture. So the biggest eigenfunction we know is lambda is a quarter plus r squared r is about 125, so lambda is very big. These are tremendous calculations by Hedgehull, who was the first to ever compute these properly. And he made a great study. And this picture was something he produced early on. And uh, it's an amazing picture. You can see anything you want in there if you want to look finely enough. But uh, we have to write, ask the right question here. Of course, you know where I'm heading. This is connected to percolation. <laughs> that's going to be roughly the picture. But that's all speculation. All right, so this is the nodal line. There's certain symmetries as a fundamental domain. This is a numerical experiment. There are a few things that immediately jump at you. You might think they cross at some places, but of course, when you resolve it, they don't cross. So it seems like the nodal, the nodal line is non-singular. In all likelihood, that's true. It's like saying eigenvalues are simple. Why should two eigenvalues have hit each other if there was no good reason for it? Why should these curves cross each other? It's very unlikely if you took a random thing you change it a little bit, it won't happen. So, of course, that's not humanly provable. I, nobody's going to prove that, I'm sure. You say that, and then tomorrow some I get an email, I proved it. <laughs> it happens to me all the time. Anyway, it looks like a hopeless thing to do, but uh, this is what the nodal line looks like. That if you want to count how many nodal components there are, or how many nodal lines there are, how many connected components are there, are, it, it, it's not even easy to do by looking at that picture. Anyway, this picture is from the 80s. It is it's still the biggest eigenfunction that I trust that's been computed. It was done using a Cray. The Cray doesn't exist anymore. The code is gone. You can't get new pictures. There were three such pictures, and I'm going to live off these three pictures in a moment. Okay. Okay, I'll get to that, what the conjectures are in a minute. All right, before I start to describe what we're going to prove in this setting or what we might want to prove in this setting, it's important to know what is generally known from the point of view of just general partial differential equations. Because you don't want to sit there and prove some theorem which then happens to be true for much more general reasons. So you should know uh, what we can do. So the most important theorem about nodal domains is a very general theorem. It's the famous current nodal domain theorem, which applies here which is stated usually in a compact situation, but it's easily proved in this situation, is that the number of nodal domains, the number of connected components of the complement, is at most the numbering of the, is at most the n. You're at most n nodal domains. And that's a beautiful minimax argument, and it's uh, a famous theorem of Courant, and it's not difficult, and it's in Courant Hilbert, and it's his favorite theorem. I think uh, this Courant Hilbert is a book written by Courant, but probably based on lectures with Hilbert lectures from Hilbert, but since this Courant theorem is Courant theorem, it appears every few chapters again and again and again. It's a, it's a lovely result. So that is an upper bound. It's not sharp. Actually, the improvement of that, showing that it's not sharp, is due to Pleyel, who I believe probably some, where was he? Where was Pleyel? Was he here? Am I mixed up? Okay, I, 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 maybe I'm mixed up. In any event, the, this is the upper bound. So I want to Stress, however, this is a global quantity. That's an upper bound. And I'm going to explain to you the, 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 some nice topological things here. Uh, there is a beautiful theorem uh, of Toth and Zeldich, which is much more recent. This is, uh, of course, 1920 something. That if you, I just want to point out the setting. The setting would be the plane, just take a domain in the plane, omega, compact domain in the plane, with real analytic boundary. And suppose you write down the eigenvalue equation, Laplace and phi plus lambda phi equals zero, with Neumann boundary conditions. So the, on the boundary, the normal derivative of the function must be zero. That's a self-adjoint problem. You get eigenfunctions, you get eigenvalues, and you can ask uh, how often does the zero set, the nodal set, touch the boundary? Let's assume that the boundary is real analytic. And I'm assuming it's normal derivative zero, so I'm asking where do we cross the boundary, which will be in a finite number of, by analyticity, there'll be a finite number of places where it might touch. And their theorem is that it touches in at most the square root of the eigenvalue. So the intersection of the nodal line with the boundary is at most the square root, some constant depending on the domain. And in fact, 
we get, this is the first aspect of the scale. A conjecture of Yao, which uh, has been proved in that real analytic setting, but is not known in the smooth setting, this shows you how tricky these questions are, is that the length, so if you go back here, suppose we computed the length, in a, because the length might be infinite for the non-compactness, so we fix to a compact piece here, and you ask, what is the length of the nodal line? That's something that is understood locally through a scaling argument uh, with, which eventually becomes uh, at the right scale some behavior of harmonic functions. So the length of this curve, whatever it is, this very complicated curve, the length, of course, is the sum of all its lo local pieces. So you can work out the length locally. Anything local is much easier to study than something like the number of components, which is global. Anyway, the length is at most is bigger, this should be sub phi, is bigger than a constant times the t is the square root of the eigenvalue. So I'll use the parameter t as the basic parameter. It's bigger than a constant times t and less than another constant times t. That's a conjecture of Yao that that's always true. It's not known, but in the real analytic case, this was solved by a beautiful, long time ago, by Donnelly and Pfefferman. Uh, the other things I want to put in here, which we'll be using in, anal in analyzing the nodal domain, are how big, what's the maximum no that the eigenfunction can be? So these are general facts on any, say, compact Riemannian 2 manifold, and the fact that our manifold is not compact is not serious here, and I'm always going to stick to a compact piece anyway. And that is if the L2 norm of the eigenfunction is 1, which is how you always normalize an eigenfunction, which is a bound state, then the L infinity norm is at most. So these are the results in analysis. This is due to Hormanda. At most, t phi to the half, or lambda to the quarter. And this bound is actually sharp if the manifold with a round sphere. So locally, you can't improve this bound. It's not something that can be improved by just looking locally at the problem. These are all local problems. So uh, these are all results which follow from local analysis. All the general results all follow from local, except Currents, which is a global theorem which is a nice minimax argument. And finally, what about the restriction of the, uh, an eigenfunction to a geodesic, which will play a big role, a close, say, a geodesic segment? What is the lo best local bound you can give for that? Well, the L-infinity bound, as I said, was T phi to the half, but the L2 restriction, so you take the eigenfunction, you restrict it to a piece of uh, fixed geodesic, and you asked about its L2 norm when restricted to the geodesic. It's slightly better, T phi to the quarter, and again, it's sharp on S2. And this is a theorem of Burke, Gerard, and Svetkov maybe four or five years ago. So these are the general theorems that are known about eigenfunctions, and I'll be using them if I need them, and I'll be using better ones if I need them. All right, this is the main slide of this lecture. There's a fellow called Bogomolny from the Bogomolny equations in Yang Mill, field th Yang Mill theory, who worked in Yang Mills, but when he got to France, he left the Soviet Union, came to Orsay. When he arrived in Orsay, he changed fields to quantum chaos and has since been the man predicting all the most interesting phenomena, in my opinion. And uh, I want to tell you a conjecture of his and his co-worker, Schmidt. Uh, and this conjecture, like all his conjectures, is what I would call heuristic reasoning. It's, he'll tell you something, then, or you'll, people will do numerics. They are able to compute highly excited eigenfunctions. They'll not know what to look for, and he'll say, this is what you should be looking for in that picture. And he says, he tells us what to look for in that picture. And then he gives a back-of-the-envelope heuristic argument relating this to some probabilistic thing and this to something else. Then you check numerically, and he's right to seven decimal places, and you're just in awe. But of course, his reasoning is real heuristic, sometimes a little too much giving false conjectures. But here, this turns out to be, I'm sure, correct. So based on the following philosophy, so this is the philosophy of quantum chaos, that if your mechanical system, so imagine, I will get back to the modular group immediately, but imagine that you have classical mechanics. Classical mechanics here in this domain would be you playing billiards inside this domain with angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, and you look at a billiard motion. That's the classical mechanics. If that mechanics is complicated, meaning it's chaotic in, in the, all notions of chaos, which can happen, you know, Banimovich stodiums, things like that. Then when you quantize, which is to solve this eigenvalue problem, say with the Riechle boundary conditions or Neumann boundary conditions, you can ask 
how the eigenfunctions behave either statistically or individually when the h bar, when you have what's called semi-classical classical limit, which in this case, because of certain scaling, is just eigenvalue go to infinity. When the eigenvalue goes to infinity, do the eigenfunctions reflect this classical mechanics? So quantum chaos is the subject of trying to understand the quantization of a classically chaotic system, which is a difficult thing. And there are many conjectures, or mostly false, but they're probably true generically, about the relation between the quantum and the classical. So one of the standard uh, heuristics is that uh, eigenfunction in a highly chaotic classical system, a highly excited eigenfunction, which is what we're looking at, should look like a random function. You first have to define what you mean by a random function, and you have to meet, you have to build in the scale of that its eigenvalue or something. A random band-limited function. This is one piece of heuristics, which certainly is not provable, but seems to be a good model for what you're seeing there. So you might ask, if I took a random band-limited function, real-valued, how many connected components does the zero section have? The zero set when you put f equal to zero. This is a very interesting question. So Bogomolny, based on uh, an argument which I'll give you at the bottom there, suggests that it's connected to critical percolation, critical bond percolation in a square lattice model, which happens to be one of those very few systems which is exactly solvable by Baxter. And using that, so using the suggestion, then using this exactly solvable model where you can uh, actually, f one of the few things you get explicitly, you get a prediction, and you get a universal prediction with an exact number. So let me tell you his conjecture, the bogomolny schmidt conjecture. I'll just explain one point here. So through this set of very speculative ideas, but ones which may well be correct, the his conjecture is if the classical mechanics is chaotic, then the number of, eigen, the number of nodal domains obeys a vial law. This is an amazing statement that there is an asymptotic law for the number of nodal domains. And not only is it some constant times its numbering, but that <laughs> constant is this number that he has sucked out of his thumb. This is not a number you could come, out with <laughs> come up with without some really serious reasoning. This is not he found the best fit. This is a number coming from this exactly solvable bond percolation of Baxter. Critical percolation. Roughly what... Bogomolny is suggesting is if you have an eigenfunction, say, on the torus, if you had sine nx times sine my, and n and m were roughly the same size, then the nodal set, the set where the function zero would be this product, the sine nx would give you these ones, and the sine mys would give you that one. You'd get this checkerboard. Now, because the classical mechanics is chaotic, you might think that you'll get some serious perturbation of this, or a perturbation which has some serious randomness in it. So it's not true that if you started with an integrable, if you started with a square, this conjecture is plain nonsense. It's not, this number doesn't come up. So his suggestion is, is if you're in this position here, and you make a small perturbation, imagine that uh, what this quantum quantization does in a chaotic system is to break all this, we cross here, but when we perturb a little bit, that we're not going to cross. So we're not expecting to cross. And this thing at this corner here will have to decide how this cross resolves. Does it go this way or that way? Okay, well, the critical percolation model is, let's say, with probability a half, there's no preference clearly to the one or the other. I flip a coin, and I go this way or that way. And at each ladder side, I do that. So here I replace that by this or that. Here I replace this by that or that. And I do that at every ladder side, and I then I have an answer, and then I have many of these. The scale here, he can work out what, roughly what you should be looking at. And then you have now a purely probabilistic percolation problem. Percolation is exactly a problem like this. This is called percolation, uh, bond percolation on a square lattice. And in this, this is what Baxter is able to solve. He's able to tell you asymptotically how many connected components there are. And that's where that number comes from. And Bogomolny is suggesting that once you take the right scale with lambda and n, so this number comes from critical percolation, that this should be true. Okay, now how do you believe such a thing? This is from 2002. I personally saw this and said, wow, that's amazing. Why? Well, of course, 
these guys, are, their, their main proof was to take, the only proof was to take a number of examples of these planar domains which are chaotic, for which Schmidt has a, had a, a beautiful code to compute thousands of such highly excited states and do the count and then check if that's true. And that turns out to be reasonably true. So Gauche and I were looking at this and wondered if for the modular group they write. Now why would we expect, so uh, Bogomolny is not talking about the modular group. He's talking about a classically chaotic system when you quantize it. But the, as I mentioned in the first lecture, the modular group, the classical motion of geodesics is chaotic. It's the main example of a chaotic classical mechanics. So if this conjecture, now when a physicist like Bogomolny makes a conjecture, there's no side conditions or anything. The following is universally true. <laughs> so it should apply in this example. So we checked. Well, I had to, this is how I colored it in to try count the number. <laughs> this was before uh, uh, Gauche's daughter showed us something called paint that I'll show you. It's some nice program which does this much more easily. Anyway, I colored it in, as you can see. You only need two colors, that's obvious. Uh, where phi is positive, where it's negative. Then I was able to count these and locally see how many connected components there were compared to his count. And he's good to three decimal places in all the examples I've looked at. And I've had students look at other examples. This is a universal phenomenon. There's no question this number is a constant of nature in this problem. I'll explain it. This number even enters into... into this comes from... This number is a, a universal number which is connected with m any problems about zero sets of random functions, including zero sets of uh, real projective plane curves. I won't go into it, but numerically I can show you this is a universal number of the world. But it's coming from bond percolation. Now, in percolation theory, there are all these universality questions and SLE and things like that. So, of course, Bogomolny doesn't stop there. He starts to predict many more things, many of which seem not to be true. But this is the only thing I will talk about in this lecture. I am complete, I mean, you go do this, doesn't matter what he said, he says this is the answer and you check and sure enough, it's correct. So you're compelled to try answer this. Why is this happening? And this is an extremely difficult question, I want to explain why. So going back to Courant's work, he, already in Göttingen, one of his first students by the name of Stern, so Courant was interested whether the number of nodal domains needs to increase with the eigenvalue, is that, and remember now, the number of nodal domains is not a local, it's not the sum of local quantity. It's a global question. This is really a question about, suppose I give you a random variety, what's its topology? This is about the topology, it's the simplest kind of question, is how many connected components does a zero set of a random function have? We have to define for you a random function. Uh, that's where this number is universal. Anyway, coming back to here, you, uh, Stern showed that even on the square, tor on the fl square lat torus, you, where you have sine nx, sine my, those are the eigenfunctions. If you, you there, there are multiple eigenvalues there because you can write the eigenvalues n squared plus m squared, and you can write a number, some numbers, in more than in many different ways if the number's got many factors. So he constructed a sequence of eigenfunctions on the flat torus with arbitrary large eigenvalue, with only two nodal domains. So Courant's theorem is not sharp, we know that, but it's not even, there's no reason for the number of nodal domains to grow. Bogomolny is giving us an asymptotic prediction if the classical mechanics is chaotic, which it isn't in this example. And this is an example, he makes, this is how, this is just sort of your enemy. Maybe the function just has like a jigsaw puzzle and breaks up into two components like this, which locally you wouldn't be able to tell what any difference between anything else. But globally, they just glued like this to make just two components. So if you think it's easy, I don't know any tool other than one, two, which you will see in the lecture, of guaranteeing that the number of nodal domains even increases. So in fact, that's what I'm going to report here, is a, it's what we set out in this paper, to prove that the number of nodal domains goes to infinity with the eigenvalue. So there's no local reason, this is a global topological issue, there's no uh, easy thing that we know of making the number of nodal domains grow. I will not prove that it grows as fast as Bogomolny is predicting. I'll just be happy to prove that it grows. 
and you will see that this is connected with number theory. So I don't know, nobody knows how to do anything in any situation where you don't have arithmetic tools. So let me explain the role played by the symmetry. So we're going to exploit that symmetry. So in a way, this is the key th cr crutch on which we're going to depend to, cre to create non-trivial topology. So remember, we have this fixed point set of this, this th union of three geodesics. And because this isometry of the modular curve is an isometry of the hyperbolic metric, any nodal domain of any eigenfunction, its image, so if, if the eigenfunctions, they are actually multiplicity one, they are Hecker eigenfunctions. So if I take a nodal domain, I apply this isometry, the new set will also be a nodal domain of the same eigenfunction. So the isometry has a property, and if I look at the connected components, say, it's either going to take a connected component, it will either, uh, either fix it or it will split it into two pieces. I'll show you a picture. So I'll call the nodal domains which are split, split, and the ones which are fixed inert. And I do this because it's very reminiscent of splitting of primes in a number field and the count will, according to Bogomolny's conjecture, certainly uh, have this feature that you'll see in a second. So now you see a better picture. <laughs> Somebody colored it in with a computer. Uh, so there is apparently this program, you, you take the, the, gr the grid there, so take the picture, and you just press a little something that says paint, and then paint the connected components into colors. The three colors here, the gray is and the pink are just to indicate the different components so that we see them next to each other, but I'm making gray and pink the inert ones and green the split ones. So you can see here that this component here, the, remember the, there's this isometry which reflects amongst other things around here. So you see two of them. These are obviously the isometry will take that guy to that guy, that guy to that guy. They're these green ones are all split ones. While over here the isometry will take this guy to itself. So they're inert ones and they're split ones. And I want to break the count. Remember we want to count the number of nodal domains. I want to break it into these two because one of them we can understand and the other one we have no idea how to handle. All right. So I'll call ni the number of inert domains and ns the number of split domains. The total number is the sum of the two. The number of split domains is always even. And we're trying to understand whether the number of domains increases with the eigenvalue. And the important thing here is we have a device. Uh, and there's only one other device in the random world, not in the eigenfunction world, which I'll talk about at the end. So this is our, uh, the basis of the entire argument. So ni is the number of inert domains, and those are the ones I'm going to tell you how to produce, uh, how to say something about. So remember, we have this curve delta, which is the union of these piecewise geodesics, which is a closed curve in the surface. Let me go, let me take my eigenfunction phi and traverse the curve delta from one point all the way around to its where I came back. And let me look at the number of sign changes of phi. Phi can't vanish on this. I'll give you a proof of that. Phi, remember, is an even eigenfunction. It can't vanish on this curve. So it'll ch uh, if it hits, if it may have no sign changes, but if it has sign changes, it has to have an even number. And I'll let k, little kappa of phi be the number of sign changes. And then there's a simple topological argument, which is the basis of everything. I won't give it here, but it's a nice topological argument that the number of inert domains is at least the number of, of sign changes and at most the number of intersections of the zero set with this curve delta. Meaning if I want to understand the number of inert nodal domains, I am more or less reduced to trying to understand the number of sign changes of phi as I traverse this boundary, and I've reduced the problem by one dimension. Doesn't mean the problem's easy. How do you know that phi's changing sign? This is, of course, in that counterexample of the student of Courant, the thing does not change sign around the boundary. We don't know what these eigenfunctions are. We're not saying, if they're random, you can obviously build in this sort of thing. But if you're not random, you are a Hecker eigenfunction, you have to tackle it from some view. And of course, we will be using L functions, which don't seem to be related to this. Anyway, so this is the main tool whereby we will manage to create any nodal domains. Uh, when Hedgel had these pictures, uh, we, we always tried to say something about it, but this is sort of first passage, this tool here. All right, so 
the tools we're going to use to try to create sign changes, I'm going to give you the argument which is going to, so I now want to make sign changes and hence create inert nodal domains. So there are some things we do know about eigenfunctions in, these, in this modular domain today, and they all involve restriction of the eigenfunction to various sets. And this is what this quantum unique ergodicity, so in a way we had to wait for quantum unique ergodicity to be solved before we could tackle this much harder problem. And that has been solved. I mentioned one holomorphic version that Sound and Holowinski had solved, but there's an eigenfunction version which was solved before due to Linden Strauss. Sound Arara John's name is he removed the technical condition about escape of mass, which is an easy thing, but it's an important thing. And what this QUE says, applied in the simplest version here, is that if I take a subset of the modular group, of the modular surface, I mean, and I take my eigenfunction, so this is always this picture. Suppose I take a subset here. In one of the lectures, I told you about the number of zeros inside here. It, the quantum unique ergodicity conjecture is about the mass. So you take this L2 normalized eigenfunction, you take phi squared, and you compute what the integral of phi squared over this domain is. It's clearly going to be less than or equal to 1. And the con statement is that the restriction of the L2 norm, which is just that mass, converges to the area of B over the area of X individually. And that's a theorem today. That was the QUE conjecture. That's true for every eigenfunction. So in particular, we know that our, this very crude fact about our eigenfunction, that if you just look at its mass, it must give the right mass to any piece in the limit. I want, to, I want to try to use that at some critical moment to, to force sign changes along a restriction to a geodesic. The second thing that will be absolutely critical in this proof is the theorem of Ivanich and myself from 95, that if you look at the L infinity norm of the eigenfunction, the trivial bound of Holmanda, the convexity bound, was T phi to the, court, to the uh, half, and we were able for these Hecker eigenforms to develop a technique to obtain something which is better than, by the, an exponent, better than the bound one half. And that will be, without that, we, we would not get any, even one nodal domain. So this extra exponent there will give us some mileage. And if we had the right conjecture here, we would produce more or less the right number. All right, so uh, I have to make a confession that the main theorem will be dependent on the Lindelof hypothesis, which seems to have nothing to do with this, but I need to, not everybody is completely familiar with this, so uh, let me just remind you what that is. The Lindelof hypothesis, I mentioned it in one of the other lectures, but it's good to review it, I think. You take the Riemann zeta function, for, for it'll be for not for the Riemann zeta function, but for other L functions, is that the Riemann zeta function on the critical line grows at most like uh, arbitrary small power of its conductor. So I'm going to be assuming something like that. Uh, we've tried to remove it. Uh, we've been limited in that way, but that's apples and oranges, so I'll point that out. I also want to point out that this conjecture, we expect here that the L infinity norm is at most T phi to the epsilon on a compact set, and if th that's a conjecture of mine, and if that's true, it's a very deep conjecture because it implies a Lindelof hypothesis, and it puts a Lindelof hypothesis in the context of eigenfunctions, not, shows that Lindelof is a very robust thing while Riemann is a very rigid thing. You can't generalize Riemann. Riemann. You can't deform L functions. Riemann is something very special. For all the automorphic L functions, it should be true. That's why it's hard. It's for these special guys. While Lindelof seems to be a very general feature from this about the L infinity norm of an eigenfunction. If, it's the, if you're a chaotic system, uh, the eigenfunction, like if you think of sine nx, that's a good model, but that's not a chaotic system. Sine nx doesn't grow as the eigenvalue grows. The L infinity norm doesn't grow. So on, but this is conjecture says that on the modular surface these eigenfunctions are fluctuating very highly because they, uh, they're oscillating with, with the frequency, but they shouldn't, they're not bounded, we can prove that, uh, but they don't grow faster than the eigenvalue for the epsilon. That, if true, would imply Lindelof. So it's... it's No, for a single compact set and applied to Eisenstein series. Yeah, for one specific point, in fact. <laughs> Comes from uh, actually a, a period form. <laughs> All right. Uh, Marshall has also proved the analog of uh, 
Ivanets and my theoretical restriction to a geodesic improving over the local bound, I won't be using that. All right, now I want to give you the theorems that will allow us to create sign changes. They will all involve restrictions. So remember, I want to compute, I want to prove that as I traverse this curve, uh, I have my highly excited eigenfunction phi, I traverse the curve and I want to prove little kappa sub phi, which is the number of sign changes grows. So I'm going to, sh in order to do that, I'm going to restrict the eigenfunction to this delta. And I want to see some things about it which will allow me to inspect and see the sign change. Okay, so I'm going to restrict to delta. And I firstly want to point out that it's elementary that the restriction of phi, it's not obvious if I give you a curve in, in, in the modular group. I don't know how to prove anything like this. Suppose I give you a curve in the modular group, a real analytic curve. I restrict phi to that. Maybe it, the restriction is zero. After all, that curve may be part of the nodal domain. But suppose I fix the curve, then maybe you'd say, well, it might be part of the nodal domain, but if I wait long enough, it won't be. And then it so I want, to, it's sort of like a, there's a Bizu theorem here. The eigenfunction is behaving like a random real plane curve of degree roughly t, where t is the square root of lambda. And I want to understand that either I restrict and I uh, agree but if I don't agree, then I probably intersect in a certain number of points. So I want to give up and lower bounds for these intersections. And I would just want to point out that the restriction of phi <coughs> to a closed horror cycle, uh, to any horror cycle segment or to any geodesic segment, those are the segments we understand. The geodesic segment is going to be the most important for us, the segment part of delta. But anyway, the restriction to any horror cycle segment or geodesic segment cannot vanish identically. This is important because I'm going to try to give a lower bound for the restriction. This is the hard theorem. And if I don't, you can't give a lower bound for the restriction if it's sort of not obvious that the restriction is not identically zero. If the restriction is identically zero, how could you give a lower bound? So for the horror cycle, if it's a periodic horror cycle is a special argument. If you're not a periodic si horror cycle, you can use Dunne's theorem. Very cute, because if you restrict phi to a piece of horror cycle and it vanishes, According to Dunne's theorem, you're either periodic or you're dense. It's actually Hedlund's theorem in that case. He, Dunne gives you even equi distribution. Now, of course, everything's real analytic. So if phi restricted to this is zero, then it's zero on the whole extension. And if that's dense, then you are vanished identically. And of course, my eigenfunction is not identically zero. For the geodesic, this is <laughs> not true. There are closed geodesics on which phi can vanish in principle, but not for the modular group. That's a theorem, yeah. And the reason is if you or, or any geodesic segment also. So suppose you vanish on some geodesic segment, then you look at the universal cover, and you take the complete geodesic that this uh, is defining. Phi vanishes on that little piece. By analytic continuation, phi vanishes on the entire geodesic. If phi vanishes on the entire geodesic by the reflection principle, phi is odd with respect to reflection about that geodesic. So you now get that phi has an extra periodicity property. It was first invariant under uh, the modular group. Then I made phi even. It was invariant under the reflection, one extra reflection. Yeah. And now if it's not, so if the geodesic is not one of these three things, which it isn't because I'm assuming phi is even, then I will have an extra element, extra isometry of the whole space under which phi is invariant. And then you use the fact that the, this slightly bigger group is a maximal discrete subgroup of the, of the isometries of the space. And so then there has to be a limit point, and then you come back and you make an argument with analytic, the local argument that phi doesn't vanish everywhere. So there's a soft argument that phi doesn't vanish when restricted to a horror cycle or a geodesic. Now I'm going to prove to you a much stronger statement, which isn't going to involve all the machine work. So the first theorem is take a closed horror cycle inside the modular curve. Take your large, highly, I, I, this is going to be true. It's, of course, T phi goes to infinity. Restrict phi to a closed horror cycle. Remember, the L2 norm of phi is fixed at 1. And now restrict it to a closed horror cycle. Then the, this is one of the nice things. So this is where arithmetic is extremely powerful. I don't know how to prove anything like this without arithmetic. Arithmetic, Riemann, Lindelof, allow you to look quite deeply at one eigenfunction at a time in a very highly chaotic system, which is physically, numerically you can do that, but physically, analytically, it's, you're not supposed to be able to look at one eigenfunction. <laughs> but arithmetic allows you to do that, and, and even sharply here, unconditionally. 
The restriction of P on this closed horror cycle, I just hope I convinced you that it can't be zero, and I'm saying not only can't it be zero, it's bigger than T to the minus epsilon. It can't be too small and it can't be too large. And similarly, if you take a segment of geodesic on our fixed set, delta is always this fixed set that's playing such an important role, then if this length of this fixed segment is sufficiently large, our proof is very delicate, so we're winning by constants, so we have to make this length large, then the restriction of phi to this segment is bounded from below, universally, by some fixed constant, and again, at most, by t to the epsilon. And a corollary from this that I'm going to outline, because I want to show you you get sign changes, is uh, proof that this uh, zero set, the nodal line of this eigenfunction, is behaving like a plane projective curve of degree about t. This is a bizu type theorem. That is, the, z the zero set, the nodal line, intersect the closed horror cycle. So remember the original picture, you had this complicated winding nodal line. Ask, you ask, how often does it meet a closed horror cycle? And you get an upper bound, which is presumably the truth, T phi, and you can actually show that it cuts in at least T phi. So this is not Bizu, this is something much more. Bizu gives you an upper bound for the number of intersections, real intersections with two curves. One of them's fixed here, that's the horror cycle, if it's analytic. And the other one, if it's behaving like degree T, is this upper bound here. So the, the upper bound is the less useful thing to us, but it's good to know. The lower bound is what we're creating in this corollary from um, this, and I'll show you why in a minute. And then the most important thing to us is if we assume the Lindelof hypothesis, that's the only place we assume it, but we do assume it, then I can, we can prove the same theorem for a geodesic segment. Remember, I was trying to create sign changes, and I'm going to show you how we create sign changes along uh, a segment of the geodesic, a segment of this fixed set, because that eventually created inert domains, and inert domains are nodal domains. So if I assume the Lindelof hypothesis for L functions, and you'll see in a second why I need to assume something so strong, then for beta, a segment inside delta, I can give a lower bound for the number of intersections of the zero set with that segment. In other words, that's saying that the zero set cuts this beta in at least that many points. I'm creating sign changes by hand, well, by this argument. So this will create the sign changes, this lower bound. Let me just give this argument quickly, because it's a, a very crude argument, and it's very similar to the argument of Hardy, the same old Hardy that we were <laughs> discussing right at the beginning when we started this series. Hardy, uh, actually, I've got to tell you, I once looked at Brita Encyclopedia Britannica, and what's Hardy's known for? He's known for the Hardy-Weinberg law in genetics, which is an elementary probabil probability calculation with a, uh, one generation to the next, uh, which is a well-known, very useful law, which he tried to remove himself from. And then he's well-known as he worked on analysis and the Riemann zeta function, and he proved there are infinitely many zeros of the Riemann zeta function on the line of half. He was the first to prove that. And his proof was based on comparing, he makes this function which is real on the half line, and it vanishes where zeta vanishes. Riemann had this, of course. But then his argument is to show that if you integrate the function over a segment, and, and you integrate the absolute value of the function over the segment, if those are different magnet of different sizes, the function's real, then it has to cross somewhere. And that's the argument we're going to use to make the sign change. So the L function is given by an integral like this, the integral of phi of i, y along the vertical geodesic. This is Hecker's formula for the L function, for the completed L function. And from the Lindelof hypothesis for the L function, it follows easily from estimates for the L function on the half line, that the integral from any alpha to any alpha prime, the phi of i, y, dy over y is arc length, is, so remember the function phi is highly oscillatory. So we would expect that if we integrate phi over a little segment and it's oscillating with some frequency t phi that we would get some cancellation. And that is not obvious. That's where we, the, to get this exponent which I need, the trouble is I don't just need to know it goes to zero, I need this exponent, is inputting Lindelof. So the integral of phi on any little segment on the vertical geodesic cancels 
like t to the minus a half. All right, now I want to show that phi has a sign change. So let's suppose that uh, the sign changes of phi are at, al at alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, up to alpha a, alpha l. Suppose these are the points where phi changes sign. Then the integral of the absolute value of phi over the segment, this is arc length, will be, be the absolute value will be the integral, I break it up into these segments where I take the sign of the function and then I integrate the function without the absolute value because I've made the sign fix it up. And this will be less than or equal to, this is just a less than or equal to the number of some ands here, L. And these, each of these integrals by Lindelof is t to the minus a half. So I have an upper bound for the L1 norm of the restriction. On the other hand, our main theorem gives us a lower bound on the L2 norm. So the L2 norm on the restriction is bigger than a constant. Now I can try estimate the L2 norm by the L1 norm at the cost of bringing in the L infinity norm. So the L2 norm is at most the maximum of the function times the integral of the absolute value. The maximum is t to the 5 twelfths by the theorem of Ivanich and myself. Remember, slightly better than a half. On the other hand, this Lindelof is giving t to the minus a half. So the fact that this exponent is less than a half gives us a little bit of an exponent there, in fact, one, one twelfth. And that gives then a lower bound that the number of sign changes must at, be at least be t, t to the one twelfth. So that's the crude argument, and the only argument I know to make sign changes in this setting, because what do we know about the eigenfunction? And the arithmetic is brought, through, brought in through L functions and these subconvex bounds. All right, so that is, leads to the following theorem. Assume the Lindelof hypothesis, then the L, uh, for the L functions, then the number of inert nodal domains, and in particular the number of nodal domains, goes to infinity, which is the main theorem. They, except for that last step, the restriction theorems, these very sharp restriction theorems, which are of interest of themselves, are uh, unconditional. Now, I want to point out that Bogomolny's conjecture, so from the upper bound, you immediately learn that the, no the number of inert nodal domains is at most t. Now, t, remember, is equal to square root of lambda. Bogomolny's conjecture is that the number of nodal domains is asymptotic to this magic constant times lambda, which is t squared. So they may, even though in that picture there were much fewer green ones, his conjecture is they're about t squared green split guys. And there are, we know, because it's not compact, they're at most t log t inert ones. We're producing t to the one twelfth of those. That's the main achievement. They are at most square root of what he's predicting, inert ones. So we want, they're the inert ones and the split ones. We have no idea how to make even one split one. This is a really interesting problem. Just create for me one split one. Most of them are supposed to be split. The percolation suggests most of them are split. But this is very similar to counting primes in an extension. The inert ones are always square root of the total number. The split ones, there are many more when you order them at the bottom. The symmetry makes you see far fewer. And so it's completely consistent with the fact that you split your problem into even and odd. And the only reason we split into even and odd is we have only one glo way to become global that we know. And that is to use the, the, that lemma, the topological lemma, which reduces now to si sign changes. Otherwise, how do you know that you don't fit into that puzzle and just have two components? All right, I'll, uh, I want to finish on time for a change. <laughs> so <laughs> let me skip the very subtle proof of the uh, uh, this took us a long time to iron out this the details unconditionally. We're winning by constants, and uh, it's a strange mixture of asymptotics from the 19th century of airy functions with Hecker eigenvalues and arithmetic and estimates towards Ramanujan being used in the proof. And the airy function part is very tricky, uh, and it's connected with the separation of variables when you solve this uh, equation in the modular group, these k bessel functions, which it's very easy to make mistakes with these k bessel functions. I won't go into that. It's technical. Anyway, I want to say something general. So this is the proof. So let me end by telling you one theorem that does exist in the literature very recently, and it's not about eigenfunctions, individual eigenfunctions, but it's about linear combinations of eigenfunctions, and which uh, allows you at least to in the fantasy of Bogomolny, see that one part is at least the right order of magnitude in a probabilistic world. So it makes you feel a little more comfortable, and it's anyway a very interesting fact. 
So there's work of Nazarov and Soden, which is quite striking. What they can show, or if you extend their methods, they, they work just on the sphere, but you can prove what I'm excuse me, about to say. Yeah? Instead of looking at my eig individual eigenfunctions phi j and asking how many nodal domains does an individual eigenfunction have, which is a very difficult problem, let me change the problem and make a random function in the following sense. So remember, I'm trying to understand tj. tj is about t. All the techniques that, even in this probabilistic setting, the, the things you are allowed to look at are sums of eigenfunctions. Those come from traces. So let's look at the sum of uh, all the t's which lie between t and t plus 1. By Selberg's production of these, there are about t of them. So I'm not going to look at, I'm going to take a sum of phi j's. These are the orthonormal basis. But the cj's here, I'm going to make random numbers. I'm doing probability now. Let me make a random function on, on the surface where the cj's are Gaussian. They, Gaussian means 0, variance 1, and independent. So we could ask, what does this function C look like with high probability? That's the standard problem. But this is, not, this is a much more difficult problem. What I'm about to ask is, let me take a random band. As I, call, I like to call this a random band-limited function. A band-limited between T and T plus 1. The, lim the band is going to be very important. So I take this function, it's real value. These C's are real valued Gaussians. And I ask, what is the 0? So I now put C equal to 0. How many connected components does a random function have? This is a very basic question. I give you a random function. How many compon components does it have? With probability 1, or tending to 1. And the answer is that Soden and Nazarov's methods will show that the number of connected components is asymptotic to some constant. They can't say what the constant is, but it's asymptotic to a constant times t squared. So the number of connected components is in the right order of magnitude consistent with Bogomolny's conjecture. The constant, however, is not related in any way that we know to percolation. On the other hand, you can do numerics on this problem, and I have a number of undergraduates who've experimented with this in their senior theses in Princeton, three or four theses, and this constant can be evaluated by Monte Carlo, and it's exactly Bogomolny's constant. It's exactly for the moment. So this uh, is a probabilistic theorem, which at least makes one a little happier with that connection. Um, there is a, some analog statement about the uh, ovals of a random plane projective curve that uh, we have developed, uh, and that's a purely random question. So suppose I give you a plane projective curve of degree t. So this is a polynomial homogeneous polynomial of degree t with real coefficients, and I make it random. How many ovals does it have? This is a very basic question. The maximum number of ovals is called the Harnack curve because the upper bound for the number of real components is basically the genus of the two or something, and they can be achieved as Harnack show. And suppose I choose a random curve. It turns out that the random curve has a certain percentage of the number of, of, of the maximum. So you, I have to define what I mean by random, of course. Properly defined, it's a real Fabini study metric, and it's provable that the random plane curve has uh, like 0.2, some constant that's coming from, again, from numerical experiment, 0.2 times the Harnack upper bound. So that's if you draw an elliptic curve, do you draw one or two components? Depends what random means, and I'll tell you what you should do when you tell me what random means. But if you take a very high degree curve, there's this universal number that comes out, completely universal. Whether it's connected to percolation, we don't know. Well, thank you very much for listening. If, okay, so in this random setting, yeah, we take a random function, these are essentially the same. Because if you are non-singular, so if the curves, by the way, uh, in, in, in this topological argument, you have to worry about whether you cross yourself, but luckily all inequalities when you cross go the right way for us. 
But if you don't cross yourself, the number of no, uh, connected components and the number, so the number of components of the ovals, and of course, so that's the number of closed curves that you're getting. Uh, it's a simple formula, two twice plus one or something times the number of connected components of, that they produce of the complement. So they are equal up to an uh, explicit expression. But it's not true if you singular. But of course in this random, if you take a random linear combination of functions, the zero set is non-singular with probability one. In the generic situation, in the random, yes, yes. If, uh, whatever, with the I didn't tell you what, the, in, this ra in any model that's reasonable, in particular what I call the random Fabini study curve, if you choose the random plane real curve according to this Fabini study Gaussian, which I can show you later what it is, then uh, with, yes, the gener with probability one, it's non singular I mean, that has to be true, I mean, as you know, I mean, uh, if you jiggle it a little bit, the condition that you're singular is a, algebra is a lower dimensional space and you're not going to, I mean, if this Gaussian doesn't, <laughs> it's not going to uh, give any mass to a sub-manifold of some degree. I do have some references. Now, what I will promise is to send all these uh, with things like this, with references, so that anybody who wants to uh, follow up on anything that was absolutely unclear here, it might be a little less unclear after looking at the reference. <laughs> yeah, thank you.